Hi, uh, we've been here today at Resist TV doing uh, a panel today on resisting corporate media and I'm with Matt Kennard and he is going to tell me how he felt today went. Uh, what are you going to take away from this? Um, well, it was a great discussion. There was a lot of um, interesting people and a lot of grassroots journalists who were trying to figure out, like we all are, how you can resist corporate media when it's so powerful financially um politically everything so i think that my main takeaways were that we need a program which can completely circumvent corporate media because what a lot of people were saying was that um any kind of engagement with them uh should be stopped i.e we should stop reading them but also stop writing for them um and i, I I've, I've long thought that but it's it's uh it's a position that takes some time for some people to come to because there obviously are incentives to writing for the mainstream media in terms of outreach, financial interests, other, other things. So I think it was quite promising that so many people are on, on that page now because it took me a while to get there. I was writing for The Guardian up till 2017. Um, I used to work for the Financial Times. So it has you kind of have to deprogram yourself from the idea that the mainstream media and the corporate media is something that should be aimed for. Um, I think aside from the boycotting, an interesting point that came out was how do we build in that context if we're not using the mainstream media and not engaging with it, how do we build a media infrastructure alongside it to actually um, to compete with it um, and, and spread truth rather than propaganda. And there were quite a few different views on that. There was quite some quite interesting points about how um, grassroots journalists, i.e. untrained ones uh, from working class communities, should be um, facilitated into uh, these uh, into our institutions and should be promoted much more than they are, uh, which I think is a fair criticism. I think that um, uh, there's not enough working class representation in independent media, um, and that's it, that's something we have to fix in a quite a conscious way because it's not just going to appear. We have to have fellowships. We have to have training programs, which are sp specifically set up for working class communities to try and give them a voice and, and give them the skills they need to, to do journalism. Yeah, because there are plenty of um, institutions that create pathways for people of minority to get into journalism, but it's all to get them into mainstream media journalism. So it's all about perverting their beliefs and causes and their ways of life to, to the neoliberal narrative, isn't it? That's exactly right. And, and that is... That is our major problem because if you just think about someone, whether they be or from any class or any colour, if they come out of journalism school or come out of their degree, where do they go? They Most people want to have a career, right? They they, they, they might have a, kids later on. Yeah, pursue, and there's no they might funding have a mortgage. with us. Yeah, they're, they're, there's no career path. That, yeah. that, so you're kind of forced into going into the establishment media, the corporate media, and you're forced to compri compromise your principles because a lot of people start out with these principles because there's nowhere else to go. And that goes back to what I'm saying. We need to create the infrastructure where people don't have to sacrifice a normal life to do the journalism they want to do. And I think it's possible. We just need to, f that there's so many, and we talked about this again today about, about the what funding. are the models, what yeah, are the models, models that exist? There's subscribers, there's foundations, there's um, uh, members, there's all these different ways of doing it. I, and there's unions. That was another thing that came up, where the unions should fund. And I think that we're kind of at an incipient stage for independent media in this country, which is actually very exciting. There's all sorts of institutions which have come up in the aftermath of Corbynism, really. Yeah, um, we've we've got about 50, 50 groups, uh, you know, in, independent media types uh, within the Independent Media Association, and we're networking, we're working together, and we're trying to raise everybody's voice, but it's funding, mm. and the unions can't, won't, don't fund us. They funded their own media, which is union media, which is one guy, as it happens, who is very good, but... He doesn't network very far, so he's a lone voice in the wilderness as well as all the rest of us. So, yeah, we, we do have to make this conscious effort to, A, include people from uh, working class backgrounds who can't who can't go to university to take a media course for a start mm. they can't afford to and then also their lived experiences are what the stories that we should be telling mm. 
and mm. like somebody mentioned that so many of us um, in the in the journalism arena are telling the stories about global conflict and global problems and we're not talking about um, the, 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 the real lives of people in this country uh, the £20 cut in universal credit we're not talking about that we're not talking about the fact that um, black people uh, are suffering still so badly 200 years after slavery was supposed to have been abolished you know and, and uh, other th lots of other things so what are you taking from this is it a renewed decision a renewed effort to to make sure that we evolve yeah i mean uh, uh what we do at the classify is a bit is a bit different I guess, because we're not a sort of generalist outlet. We don't cover everything. We're quite specific in that we cover UK foreign policy. So the things like the £20 cut in universal credit would just be a topic that we don't cover. Yeah. But what you're saying is totally true. And I think that what needs to happen is that media institutions need to be embedded in communities much more than they are. Um, firstly, because you have a media class and a class of journalists that are very different to the people they cover. Mm. They're, they're, they're in fact they're above the people they cover in terms of class so um, we find people coming to us with well of course you won't want me interested in this because you're an ex-reuters journalist yeah you know so yeah. and, and the same with you you won't be interested in this because you you'd cover foreign policy yeah yeah, yeah. Yes. but there is uh, there yeah, is something and, and, and i think that that would change the complexion of journalism if you had more people that were working within their own communities it, it would produce better journalism yeah, it because would, yeah. people who are more in tune with their communities know more people no no get have more contacts have more sources but and and the other thing about journalism is it, it's presented as this like uh, extremely difficult profession that you have to have a certain level of education and a certain qualification to do it's rubbish no that's most it's people rubbish. that most people can can learn it in a week i mean it, i'm talking about doing specific like uh, uh, written stories in terms of actually just covering an event on Twitter or something you can do you just, people don't need any, any that's any why training. we've got citizen journalism exactly. has sprung up exactly so yeah. I think that we need to and this and there's a real pushback against the democratization of media which has happened because of social media and other ways we can get our work out from the establishment journalist yeah. journalism world because they like to think of themselves as rarefied and uh, particularly intelligent and particularly skilled when they're not um, and they, and they, the, 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 the democratization of it has really um, sort of pissed them off. Yeah. Um, but it's a great thing, and I think that it it, uh, it exposes um, it exposes them because most of these Times columnists that you that we're meant to believe uh, we need to read to understand the world, they've never done a day's work, the, what day of journalism in their life in yeah. terms. Of, and and some citizen journalist or someone who's just covering a protest near them. That's more journalism than most of these guys have ever done. So it's it's a really, uh, that's what I, I do love social media for that, that it's really democratized. But then we were talking again today, this is another problem, like all these things, there's always a push, there's always pushback when you have little spaces of freedom open up. This, the, the fact is that the social media and the way we get our work out as independent journalists is controlled by Silicon Valley. Yep. Um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Facebook had to hand control over to Nick Clegg and GCHQ it, exactly. last year, year before last. So, yeah. so you, so that's the next um, frontier that they're going to start, and it's already happening, as as yeah, you know. Is, yeah. that, but, but it's going to really accelerate because independent media's power is going to grow, and the reason that and they we'll haven't clamped down more. massively now is because we're kind of marginal. But as yeah. we, as our power grows. And we're putting out information which is truthful, but actually contradicts the narratives of the establishment. Then they're going to start finding reasons to to clamp down. And in fact, you're seeing incipiently with this whole misinformation disinformation fight that the establishment is now and this intelligence agencies yeah, are now fake fighting. News. Yeah, fake news. And they're fight. Apparently, our national security state is fighting that with their accomplished journalists in the establishment. When, of course, the national security state and corporate media are the two biggest progenitors and um, sources of disinformation and misinformation in our society. It was the national security state that made up all the rubbish about weapons of mass destruction yeah. um, in Iraq that put us into that criminal war. So so it, it's all upside down, but what that, what that new fight about misinformation and disinformation tells you is that they want, 
new mechanisms to shut down critical opinion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the other one that they'll use, and they always use, you probably come across it, is, is if you say anything outside the mainstream or you don't have the imprimatur of the Times or whatever legacy institution it is, they'll say you're a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, of course. And yes. they'll never provide inf they'll never provide proof in terms of, I'm talking from a they personal perspective. They don't need to provide but proof. But there isn't any. <laughs> That's with right. our stories, that, That's well, right. they're so rigorously researched and there's, there's no speculation. Yeah. Um, but I often get that. Uh, uh, there'll be uh, trolls on Twitter will be like, oh, this is just conspiracy theory. And you'll say Craig why, Murray. and then they'll go quiet, you know? Look at Craig Murray. You exactly. Know, upstanding member of the establishment, reduced to a man in prison. Exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, Peter Oborn, you know, ostracized wherever he goes. Yeah. Except yeah. by us, of course. Yeah. Well, uh, the, so it, to, to close this off, this, this interview off, um, do you think that this is positive, this resi this event, the Festival of Resistance? Do you think it's positive and that it's going to lead on to bigger and better things? Do you know, I think it's, it's hugely optimistic because we all know the backlash there has been from the establishment against the democratic opening that happened in 2015 with the election of Corbyn. Yeah. Something happened which really scared the powers that be and they unleashed an information war like we have never yeah. seen in this country it's yeah. unprecedented in peacetime yeah the attack on corbyn but then of course everyone around him as well like chris williamson and, and many many others um that was it was fierce it and, was and, fierce and what you see is that it hasn't destroyed people people no. it raised awareness i mean obviously in terms of party politics they've they've yeah, nip that, nip that in the bud, but but there was a millions of people were made aware of issues which they never get exposed to, yeah. And that groundswell won't go away. And the fact that people people aren't pe w one of the particularly I find really promising things is is the solidarity of Palestinians and Palestine yes. because there's so much pressure on people not to speak out for palestine now because it's very it's not nice to get accused of being an anti-semite so no 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 anti-semitism is a horrible thing yeah and gilad atzman said where do you go after you've been accused of being an anti-semite where do you go from there you cannot deny it you cannot fight back against it you can go nowhere yeah so so the fact that people are still speaking out for palestinian human rights in the face of regardless such a, of yeah, that yeah it yeah. is is promising and i think that um going forward um we just i mean just to go back to f and to finish with this topic that we were talking about today we need to understand that the corporate media is at the root and not just the corporate media the bbc um and other established media is at the root of all our problems because it's very very difficult to gain momentum for a movement for any kind of um party um which you support uh, which is fighting for progressive change. Yeah, if you have a corporate media set up and incentivized to, to shut destroy them down. it, yeah, um, and they because they control so much, so many of the outlets that 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 basically disseminate information to people. So we need to. I think that it's good that it's a good sign that that that, that was the topic of the conversation today. One of them, but I think it needs to be the priority given to discussions of media ownership, media reform. Yeah, uh, needs to be pushed much higher. Corbyn did have a media reform plank uh, yeah, to did. his policy but um we we need to make sure that that retains that relevance now and so we both want to say um stop watching and listening to and reading mainstream media put your hands in your pocket and put your money into independent media thank you very much thank you matt thank you Hello everybody, I'm here at the Festival of Resistance with Pedro Carney and he is an editor and journalist at the Canary and we've just finished uh, our second session on resisting corporate media and I was very interested in your story, if you could just repeat that for us about how your radio show on a community radio show in Ireland got, um, got attacked by the Israeli lobby. Yeah, that was back in 2013. I mean, it really seems like an age ago now. Um, I did a politics show on a community radio station in the north of Dublin um, once a fortnight. I was on, It was the name of it was International Politics. It was about international politics. I would speak to people from Tibet. I'd speak to people in, in Latin America, people from all over the place. I'd even interviewed people from the Israeli embassy before. Uh, I'd interviewed Holocaust survivors as well. And then one week um, I did a piece on Gaza and there was a former Irish army captain was in Dublin that week 
and he was giving a talk about the, the Goldstein Report because he was one of the fact-finding members that participated in the Goldstein Report. Um, the Goldstein Report found that Hamas, but especially the Israelis, had committed human rights atrocities in Operation Cast Lead. And he was talking about that in Dublin. So I interviewed him uh, and Vox Pop, some others from Gaza Action, as well as a, an Irish politician who lived in Gaza for about six months. And they talked about what it was like in Gaza. And he spoke about Operation Cast Lead and how in part he believed it was a marketing exercise by the Israelis to demonstrate to the world how strong their military might was or the Iron Dome or whatever they call it. So I repeated this on the air uh, when, when the show went out live. And uh, re probably How many repeated a couple of did you have? listeners. It was a radio show. Uh, th I would say when it went live, we probably had about four, four or five, and I'm pretty sure most of them straight on by accident. Now a few more people did listen as, as a podcast, but as a live radio show, not that many. Um, but that didn't stop the Israelis. They went absolutely crazy after that. Um, some website called Five Minutes for Israel gathered all these people from around the world to attack the program, to complain to the radio station. Uh, which they did. The radio station stood up. So the next stage for the complainers then was to take it to the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, which they did. And the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland found in favour of the Israelis, of the Israeli complainants. And um, a kind of an apology or clarification had to be read out on the radio show after that. And um, I wasn't terribly happy about that because I didn't get any warning of it, didn't know what it was about. It was just played out. Um, that's, that's such a long time ago. I mean, I've um, made amends with the radio station about that. Um, but uh, the Israeli lobby were relentless. I was eventually, the show was taken off the air. Uh, I was kicked out of the media co-op and I was banned from the premises. Um, and all for my show that had, as you said, four listeners. Yeah. So yeah, they were absolutely yeah. relentless. Well, this is, this is the problem. And we've been discussing this weekend about uh, many different aspects of how we can resist corporate media. And I would just like to take this opportunity to say again, stop watching, listening and reading it. Give all the money that, you, that you've that you saved from not being a member of the Labour Party anymore because they've kicked you out. Put that money into independent media. Two quid here, two quid there. You don't have to support one particular one. You can support many of us, depending on how much money you've got, of course. If, if there was one thing that you could say to people um, that, you know, about funding independent media association is who both Peda and myself belong to along with 50 other independent media outlets uh, real media that do video coverage of all sorts of controversial subjects um, there's so many I can't name but if you look up if you google independent media association you'll find both Peda's the canary and myself unity news amongst a breadth of of different independent media covering all sorts of things and i would i would urge people to do that put your money where your mouth is and say oh the bbc's just lied again well don't listen to them L listen to us instead and what would you say what's the one thing you would want people to take away from this uh yeah as you said yourself to subscribe to independent media but not just financially subscribing to it but reading it um reading it sharing those articles and then having a conversation with people because just sharing an article isn't enough. People get so many articles in their newsfeed and links to this, that and the other. Uh, but start having conversations with people wherever you are. If it's your football club, if it's your residence association, if it's, if it's your family. Now, obviously, you have to get that balance between the person who's ranting off at others about I'm telling you what's in the media, you should listen to me. But there's ways you can handle it. Um, it's ultimately how I got to see what mainstream media was like was a, a, a very simple conversation or a simple question that my sister asked me many years ago. Um, I know, and that kind of set me on the road as you well. You were watching Cowboy and Indian We're watching film. Westerns, yeah, as we did at the time. And like most other people, you always kind of saw the cowboys as good and the, what people would call the Indians as bad. And so you would boo the, you know, the Indians and cheer the cowboys. And then one day my sister said to me, so you do realize it's the other way around. So then that really that just that simple sentence from her from a very young age started me questioning things and looking at things in a different light. So um, it may be a lot to ask people to boycott mainstream media completely. But if you're watching mainstream media, watch it with an open um, pair of eyes, pair of ears. So um, start listening critically to what it is you're being fed and then start speaking critically to the people around you. 
Yeah, because uh, the mainstream media in all its forms are not on your side. They're not there to serve your interests, are they? They're not there to make it better for ordinary people. They're there to sell you a narrative uh, that belongs to the interests that pay for ad space in their papers, that pay for ads on their TV stations. They are in turn controlled by those interested parties to further their narrative, not any truthful narrative. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, completely. So there are, uh, whether it's what people call the corporate media or the, the public sector media, the BBC in the UK or RT in Ireland, whatever it is, I, I put them all in the same bowl because they're all about maintaining the status quo. Uh, every now and then within the mainstream outlets, they have their what they would call a, a token nut. So it's kind of like, well, look, we've got this guy writing for us and speaking with us. So you can't dare say that we're a pro-establishment this guy or girl is clearly anti-establishment but it's the token not i'm not sure who you I think chomsky or somebody else somebody much more important than me originally said that anyway uh, but they keep on these token nuts to make it look like they're being critical when it's it's just a charade yes well thank you very much Pedro, and i hope that you all subscribe to the canary and look at independent media association on whatever platform you can find them that we're on twitter facebook um can't think of the other ones. Instagram. Oh, we're on TikTok now. TikTok, we started yes, our TikTok, TikTok page. Yes, so check it out. The Canary have got a fabulous just started investigative division. So if you've got a story that you need to get out there, get in touch with us. You know, we're looking for writers. We're looking for people to take part. And if you think, well, nobody will hear what want to hear what I've got to say. Well, actually, you're wrong. We will want to hear. We do want to hear what you've got to say. So please get in touch with us Absolutely. and interact with us. Read what we're writing. Uh, look at what we're filming you know there are lots of video teams on the ground none of us are getting paid anything really peanuts to do this if if that if even peanuts so we you know we do want you to help us financially if you can but we also need you to take part and become a part of it yourselves because then you know be, you're you know you're telling the truth so why don't why don't you be the person on the media telling the truth so come and join us. Hello, everybody. I'm here at the Festival of Resistance with Dr. Bob Gill. Now, lots of you will know who he is. He's almost single-handedly um, telling us about the issues with our NHS and the privatisation of it. And this weekend, he's spoken at two meetings uh, and telling people what they can do as ordinary people and I'd just like you to sort of give us a flavour of what you've been telling everybody and uh, what you've got out of this weekend as well. Yes, yeah, so my, my main goal was to try and inform as many people as possible uh, as to the imminent threat of the NHS with the health and care bill that's going before Parliament at the moment. And, people. and yeah, and what, what, what it will do is actually finish off the privatisation job. Um, it will break up the NHS into 42 integrated care systems. Uh, don't be misled by the, the terminology. These are based on the American insurance system. And they ha will have a fixed budget. And out of that fixed budget, the integrated care boards can create a surplus efficiency to me and you profit. And this profit will be maximized by the denial of care. Now, we're not hearing this from the Labour shadow health team. And, you know, I can't keep quiet about this subject because what that will mean is patients in need of operations and medical treatment won't get it. And obviously, this will lead to preventable harm and death. The other problem with the bill, it will remove an element of the 2012 Health and Social Care Act, Section 75, which at the moment makes sure that if you are going to tender services, which none of us want, we want to nationalise NHS. But if you're going to tender services, then it has to be done in an open and competitive manner. By repealing Section 75, it allows for the creation of private sector monopoly within the NHS. No scrutiny on multi-billion pound deals, a bit like we saw in the pandemic. Crony deals agreed behind closed doors and very likely you, you have close ties to the Conservative Party and the government. So that's another threat. And along with that is a call for deregulating the professions, 
removing safety and the need for people to be sufficiently qualified to deliver m healthcare. Uh, these these integrated care boards will have local negotiating rights with their staff, so it, it gets rid of union national negotiating and bargaining. Um, and there's a there's a clause which will remove the protection on patients being discharged home to have an assessment done on how they will cope. So this is called discharge to assess. So first you get discharged home, then somebody works out whether it was safe to do so or not after the event. This will allow the dumping of sick patients at home without care, exactly as we see in America. So, you know, to sum up, this is a this is the home straight of the privatization and it will be transferring control of NHS budgets to private insurance company, predominantly United Health, who had their man at the top of the NHS since 2014, Simon Stevens. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Well, I know that you were saying that uh, the doctors will be replaced by nurses, the nurses will re be replaced by care workers, and the care workers will be replaced by uh, volunteers. So, and the the middle middle class people, people that are, are fairly well off who own their own homes, which might be you, are going to find yourselves having to sell your house, sell your home, so that you can finance any health issues that you have and then you will you your uh, um, budget within the nhs is transferable so that you will have to top up that but they get their profit anyway the these insurance companies private companies yeah you, you've got to remember think about healthcare not as we think about it in this country as a human right as something we do we look after each other uh, we we've uh, we've got a government that provides us with care based on taxation the American healthcare system is where we're heading. That's all about making money. And you, you make money by denying sick people care and making sure the wage bill as, is as low as possible. So that means employing l the least qualified person. Now, who are the targets of these reforms? Well, the poor and the elderly will just go without care. The people they're really after are the middle classes who will need to top up because the NHS has been downgraded so much it will get a reputation of being dangerous and services hard to access. Long waiting lists will be the norm. Those people will go to private insurers so those if people they've got will, enough money yeah, to do that. Yeah, we're being heavily marketised at the moment, heavily advertised to get health insurance. The problem with health insurance is if you have a straightforward problem, they will pay up. Soon as you become expensive and complicated, then they look at your medical records and find reasons to deny you care. That is the business model, and that is what I want to try and get across to as many people as possible. Well, thank you very much, and I hope that all of you watch The Great NHS Heist, which is Bill, Bob's um, latest film. What was that before, before it? Yeah, I, I made a film in 2014 called Sell Off, which was, at that time, we were warning about how GP surgeries would be forced to close, how GPs would be demonised. In fact, we call it out in... 2019, uh, as the restructures took place, the governments have to identify scapegoats before they do anything. Immigrants are the easiest scapegoats, but we see playing out before our eyes how GPs are being scapegoated for lack of access, lack of face-to-face -face access. But who was it who told the GPs to close their doors and do total triage? It was the government. So unfortunately, the GPs have unwittingly fallen into a trap deliberately set by government, and now the clapping has changed to scapegoating. And that's what we're seeing unfold. Well, and thank you very much. I hope you all please follow Dr. Bob Gill. Uh, he's just Dr. Bob Gill on Twitter. I think he's just Bob Gill on Facebook. But find his films and please watch them. And please do all you can. Talk to everybody you know and try and convince them that this is actually happening because everybody's so mired in mainstream media that they don't even realise what's happening, do they? Absolutely. The, don't wait to hear this on the BBC because you never will. Um, the NHS logo will be everywhere, but the NHS that we respect and we love, the soul has been extracted and it's being turned into a cash cow for corporations. Hi, um, I'm Richard Barnard from Palestine Action. 
Um, I've been doing a workshop entitled Resistance on the Streets. Um, so this was a brief workshop into introducing Palestine action and direct action as a way of cutting out the middleman and taking direct action specifically against Israel's arm, arms trade. In terms of what we got out, we had some really interesting discussions um, about, about tactics. Um, I suppose the crucial thing for us um, is we had loads of people from our workshop who want to join us and take direct action and shut down these factories, these deaf factories, wherever they are in the country. Hello everybody, I'm here at the Resistance Festival with Natalie Strecker. Natalie is a Palestinian rights activist. She was a, a, U, a part of the UN envoy? No, a human rights monitor, but it works with the UN. All right. Uh, in Hebron in Palestine and uh, she's she's told us while she's been here this weekend she's told us some horrifying stories about what the pal Palestinians endure um, and she's told us about how we can combat that and stand up for Palestinians while reminding ourselves that while we might get ridiculed or called bad names or thrown out of the Labour Party we're not actually facing drones every day we're not actually f facing soldiers armed soldiers every day and we're not facing having a bath in the rubble of our home so if you just want to summarize briefly what you've got out of this weekend and what you think other people are going to be able to take away from this weekend and what you've been talking about while you've been here yeah um well i think what i got out from this weekend is just really reinforced to me how important solidarity is you know and it's something i said obviously yesterday that solidarity must be at the center of everything we do because that's where we get our strength from each other that's where we get the resolve to continue we're able to endure so i think that solidarity is important and actually it's the only thing that will help us to win actually this struggle that we're all obviously involved in and i think um i mean in terms of what i've got out of it generally aside from that although met some incredible people made some new friends and some met some new comrades um which is great and especially because i feel quite lonely at home in jersey <laughs> so that's been fantastic um, we're all coming over to jersey aren't we loki's yeah, well, loki's so. organizing a plane as we speak yeah fantastic i won't say why no <laughs> take down a tax haven nothing no. to do with natalie <laughs> nothing to do with me um yeah no it'd be amazing to have him come over obviously as an artist and some of the other guys um but i think that really it showed how everything was connected no matter whether we're talking about resisting the witch hunt which obviously i was on the panel for whether it's resisting um you know in terms of the nhs um the arms trade um the media corporate media all of these things, they meet at the same point, which is this um, battle we have against the ruling classes. And I think that that really is important. So if you're not, say, particularly interested, say, in the Palestine-Israel issue, it's so important to understand how it's intrinsically linked to everything else. And I think that that's really um, important um, to kind of sort of keep in mind. Um, and in terms of kind of what I covered yesterday, it was about that, and you're quite right in terms of one, how it's linked to everything else, um, but also how, you know, we need to kind of get a, get a bit of perspective. Of course, you know, for some people, you know, the reputational damage has been huge in terms of the witch hunt. And, you know, obviously Professor, Professor. David Miller was here yesterday, which was, I mean... You know, it's the first time I've met him. Obviously, I've heard him. I was on a panel um, with him last week. Um, but it seems like just a genuinely decent guy. And yet his life has been destroyed. He's lost his job. Um, you know, but that's where solidarity comes in. But actually, for most of us, it is just name calling. And I think, you know, it's a point I tried to make yesterday is it we need to make sure we don't give power to those labels. You know, name calling's not nice. People's, you know, saying stuff. But as long as we know it's not true, people really just need to kind of just grow a pair sorry i can't think of a better way of putting i'm it sorry there, but, but that was the only thing i could think, think of as well <laughs> <laughs> i mean and getting a bit of perspective you know yeah name calling's not nice but let's get real you know the palestinians 
as you said quite right you're facing drones they're facing bombs they're facing guns they're facing the demo you know the demolishing of their homes their children being killed you know the attempt to completely erase them and their history from the region you know from so the, from the face of the planet really we absolutely you know to deny their very existence which is horrendous so there's kind of that point but also i mean one of the points i, I try to make is obviously you know if we allow this witch hunts you know to win if we don't fight back and struggle back and unite in order to do it um the problem with that is that it's then open season for any issue or cause that challenges the status quo that challenges the ruling class you know that special interest groups don't want to be discussed in the public domain and i think those things are really important um to keep in mind you know and that's what i said even if we were to stay quiet you know like um is it amar i think said earlier you know the ruling class has smelt blood yeah. and they've you know israel the israel lobby has done a great job of perfecting you know this thing and, and you've actually seen i don't know if you saw the hindavta you know the you know the, the uh, Hindu extremist, you know, very similar kind of idea, trying to use the same kind of tools. So I think that it's really important to keep those things in mind. But the other thing I spoke about is actually how it undermines our moral fabric as a movement. If we don't resist, if we allow subjects to become, you know, taboo, if we take part in that then how can we say that we're truly progressive how can we say that we you know have we're internationalists and internationalists then ignore the plight of absolutely. the Palestinian people we don't have values then at our centre so it's really important and another thing that I highlighted is that we don't allow the optics left you know to so arrogantly dictate the parameters of discussion of Israel and Palestine and in terms of what anti-semitism is and isn't anti-Zionism is not anti-semitism you know it's at absolutely shameful that the Jewish community they're trying to attempt to forever connect them to what is a um, ideology of a form Was of white supremacy yes and only ever a fringe ideology according to the Jewish people absolutely so I think those things are really important so you know I think we've got to stop giving time to the Owen Joneses and Michael Walkers of the world you know to Navarra Media because I actually think they're far more dangerous at least with the Daily Mail with the right as a whole we know they're not on our side they're our enemy but the problem is when people are naive perhaps when they're not so informed haven't got so much experience that are coming in and they look to these individuals who get it right on lots of things that yeah. they can't be forgotten right. but but then they look to them for guidance on this but actually they're enabling a white supremacist movement and let's not forget you know zionists you know, lots of um, Zionists are not Jewish. In fact, many, many aren't. But there's an awful lot of Christian right Zionists and the likes of Katie Hopkins, Tommy Ro Robinson and Richard Spencer. Is that what we want to be associated with? So I say um, bin them, basically. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And uh, you can catch up with Natalie's... Uh, uh, Many visits, well, some visits to Resist TV. Uh, they're all on our YouTube channel, which Gaz, our tech, will put in the links. And thank you very much for coming this weekend. It's been a huge privilege. It's thank been you. fantastic. Thank even, you. Even sharing an apartment with you. Well, <laughs> that, that was the best bit. Sorry about her arm, everybody. <laughs> Steve, Assistant General Secretary of the RMT, it's great to have you here today. Delighted that you've taken the time out to speak at the Festival of Resistance. Uh, how did you find it? Well, thank you, first of all, for the invite. Chris, I thought it was uh, very good. I think there was a lot of ideas knocking about. I think the demise of Corbyn and the left and the Labour Party has left uh, maybe 100,000 people politically homeless. And I think we need to start thinking how we can strategically link up elements on the left, the trade union movement, housing groups, tenants and uh, socialists uh, in, in order to resist the massive attacks that are coming our way. Absolutely. And... I mean, the Labour Party, it seems to me, and you've kind of sort of alluded to this already and just in that response you've just given, but, I mean, they seem to have completely lost their way now and under Keir Starmer. I mean, do you think there's any future for the Labour Party now as the political voice of the organised working class? Well, um, we've been disaffiliated from the Labour Party for 17 years. We're actually thrown out for as a union for uh, supporting socialist candidates in Scotland. And, uh, Chris, you may remember that I argued that we should reaffiliate when Jeremy was there. Mm. And for once in my life, um, I'm glad I was wrong. You yeah. know, I, I'm yeah. glad that the, our members had more sense than me. 
And it's very difficult to see now um, how the Labour Party can be recaptured. Look, I'm not ruling it out. I think it's a it's a tactical question rather than a strategic question if people join the Labour Party or, or not. If somebody like Jeremy, uh, somebody, a socialist, gets um, the leadership of Labour Party, just let's say, for example, you were leading the Labour Party, of course we would be encouraging people to join. I would be encouraging mm-hmm. people to join. But when we've got Keir Starmer, who's basically uh, a Tory uh, by any other, other means, by any other description, and he's there, and the pol- policies are quite indistinguishable. Uh, the, the the criticisms of a government, wh- which are few and far between anyway, are very mild. Uh, there's absolutely no difference, and it's no wonder. Uh, I don't even think they're, they're coming anywhere near to coming into power. So I think uh, in the meantime, we have to start building a viable alternative. Um, are we ready for a party yet? I'm not sure. Uh, but we need to start, every class needs a party, the working class needs a party, we haven't got one. And we have to start at least cooperating uh, to get a party that will represent the working class. Mm. I mean, I, I take your point about uh, uh, Sir Keir Starmer, as I always like to refer to him. I mean, what on earth is a leader, supposedly the you know, political leader of the uh, of the Labour movement, doing taking a knighthood, a knight of the realm. And also, let's also remember, he is a member of the shady organisation, the Trilateral Commission, that was set up in the uh, 1970s and bankrolled by uh, uh, by uh, well, wealthy liberals, people like Rockefeller be- behind it, who uh, were concerned about an excess of democracy that they saw, essentially, you know, the kind of working classes getting above themselves in the 1960s. Now, you spoke at the... Uh, uh, session on uh, workers' resistance. Um, I mean, do you think that we can, you know, bring the trade union movement to more effectively collaborate? I mean, the, the TUC don't seem to be um, doing well. Have they ever done a sort of a proper job in bringing the time? You may take a different view, but I mean, you know, I just always feel the TUC maybe is not as effective an organisation as it could, or indeed should be but it seems to me there's a real potential there still even though trade union membership is nowhere near what it was in the late 1970s but you know in terms of workers resistance clearly the trade unions have got to play a key role in that so do you think there's scope for collaboration particularly in view of all the anti-trade union legislation that there is 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 a scope for you know the sort of collaboration that we perhaps saw in the 1970s too if we're going to be effective you know we then will unions sort of maybe push the boat out a little bit you think and collaborate and support you know, disputes that they may not necessarily be involved with? Well, I think the the anti-union laws in this country make it very, very difficult, if not impossible. But what I think will happen is that rank and file movements will develop independent of the trade union bureaucracy. I think that the in the 1970s, for example, um, the shop shears movement, before that uh, we had uh, in the we had other movements, minority movement, we're all rank and file movements that push the trade union bureaucracy into action. I mean, uh, but at this current time, I have to say that um, uh, I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but people like me in who are elected the leadership positions in the union, we're not holding back a deluge at the minute of people mm. wanting to go on strike. In fact, the opposite, we're trying to encourage people mm. uh, to go on strike. So that will that will uh, develop as the, econo- the economic crisis, which I think is on the horizon, develops energy prices spiralling, uh, inflation already at 5%, looking to go up more, a downward pressure from bosses wanting to maintain their profits, give more money out to the shareholders, especially in the transport industry. And I think inevitably uh, workers will fight back, they'll find some way to fight back, either through their official union structures, which is they look the first. And if they're not effective, they'll fight back through unofficial structures. Mm. Do you think there's some scope? And you sort of touched on this a little bit. Uh, I wonder if maybe you could develop it a little bit, you know, in your, in your first um, answer there. Uh, do you think there's any scope for the unions to, you know, work with civil civil society, you know, with, with, with local community groups and, and sort of, you know, build a you know, build on an ice, but sort of help, if you like, you know, to build that mm. movement. So it's a kind of a trade unionists and civil society working together. And, and I'm thinking, really, of the, of the of, as just one example, really, but the Bolivian experience where mm. we had a US-backed coup in, uh, in 2019 and uh, basically reversed uh, in less than 12 months by the movement for socialism, which is very much a combination of the of the mm. of, of trade unions and civil society working together. They kind of brought the country to a standstill, mm. essentially, mm. and forced new elections. And then, although they forced Evo Morales out, as you know, the socialists stormed back with an even bigger majority than Evo Morales got, and he got a landslide. So, do you think there's scope for that type of uh, collaboration 
so not just with unions mm. and with other unions, but um, but but with 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 civil society and pressure groups and things like that. Well, we're already building that in sort of proto form. We're we're working very closely with passenger groups. We're working very closely with disabled groups, and uh, we're trying our best to support them. Uh, you know, uh, show solidarity with them when they're in struggle. I think it's it's probably a feature that we need to consciously build as trade union mo- a, a trade union movement, because people don't go home and shut the front door, come back from work, and the, and the problem cease. Uh, especially in London where I live, uh, young people can't get a job. My a lot of my uh, daughters are in sort of precarious um, housing. They they're in private landlords, n- lack of council housing. Uh, the the price of the cost of living in London is is astronomical. Uh, workers, we have a work in poor, you know, we have working people queuing up for food banks. Uh, mm. So I think it's absolutely essential that the TUC, uh, if it can't be uh, reformed, if we can't capture positions in the TUC and turn it into a campaign and organisation, then individual unions and, and rank and file activists and unions get involved in the community as well. It's essential because you can't uh, you can't just protect yourself at work and then ignore yourself when you go home and finish work. It, it doesn't make any sense, it doesn't make any logic. Mm. And then just finally, I mean, you've been in the front line in, in sort of fighting uh, fascists on the street, uh, been injured, I know, been blooded by fascists. Um, do you see that as a, as a, as a real threat now? And, and, and what do you think is the best antidote to uh, the rising tide of uh, the fascist far right in this country? Well, um, to be fair, Chris, I think um, we were attacked and we defended ourselves. We never portrayed ourselves as victims. Um, there was a lot of injuries on both sides. Some would argue there was more injuries on their side than on our side. Um, I think I a lot of people have been cheering that as well, actually, I, I, if I that's true. Yeah. I don't think it's. I don't think it helps to play the victim. I think uh, we're the workers' movement. We should be demonstrating that we can police our own events. We don't call on the forces of a state to do it. We've got enough people out there on the left who will defend marches and rallies, and we just have to organise them. So if uh, they're attacked, uh, they have to be defended. Mm. And ultimately, um, you know, uh, you could argue the the bourgeois democracy we live in, there are certain parties we don't like, but we have to tolerate. But fascists aren't amongst them. If, no. if people are coming along with fascist ideology, they've got to be opposed by any means necessary. And, mm. and that will mean uh, when they attack people by actually fighting back on the streets. Uh, it, it's quite simple. Uh, and do you see the rising threat of a, of a, of a far right in this country is, is, is something that we need to be worried about? Well, well, yeah, because, I mean, I've been in this country for 34 years now. I've I come from Derry in Ireland, and um, I experienced racism when I came over here. That's quite died down now since the, the uh, Good Friday Agreement uh, and the suspension of armed struggle. But I, I see um, when Tommy Robinson and his followers were at their height, well funded by actually by uh, people internationally uh, on the right. There was um, tens of thousands of fascists on the streets of London and that's a thing I never saw. I, I think that the last time that happened was probably back in the 1930s when mm. they were defeated at Cable Street. But um, fascism will always rear its head during a, an economic crisis because ultimately uh, the people that run this country, the ruling class in this country, will prefer the fascists uh, to any alternative on the left yeah. because they know ultimately the fascists aren't going to uh, challenge their wealth, they're not going to challenge their power, uh, they're just going to be used as their boot boys and whereas people on the left left actually want to challenge and, and redistribute redistribute that wealth and power. Yeah. I mean, and, and certainly uh, I, when I've spoken to people who, on the doorstep, who may have been attracted, you know, by some of that far-right ideology, not necessarily out-and-out fascists themselves, but you know, they complain about asylum seekers or, or immigrants or whatever, or the scapegoats the far right like to uh, put up. I was used to say, and still do, that, you know, we have more in common with asylum seekers, with immigrants and so on, and, and the real villains of the peace are the, are the, are the people at the, at the top of society, the mm. corporate capitalists who are actually, with their wars, responsible for many of the people fleeing their home country. Because most people wouldn't want to leave their home country unless there was a, you know, a dire situation that they were, that they were facing. And I, and I think when I've posed that argument to a, a lot of uh, people, um, 
uh, you know, it, it does make people think. And, and I've got to say, I've never been hit by anybody when I've put that argument to them on the doorstep, you know, mm. and you could see people uh, thinking and uh, uh, making them think. And when I won my seat back in 2017, we went out to target UKIP voters, didn't just sort of write them off, mm. and uh, with a message of, you know, of hope and, and pointing mm. out that, look, it, it's under Jeremy Corbyn with that manifesto. It was Labour that was going to really genuinely take back control because we were going to take on these corporate capitalists. We were going to bring the utilities into public ownership. Do you think that's the sort of argument that we should be putting forward? And uh, could we develop that? Do you think that's one that you, you know could substantially resonate with a lot of people? Well, I think there there will be a certain percentage of people who will be just racists. I mean, maybe that's five percent. I don't know, uh, but I think the vast majority of people who voted UKIP. Um, who voted to leave the European Union are not inherently racist. Um, they've just been given the spin that somehow that will benefit themselves. And, you know, and it's, it, it might, you know, look at lorry drivers. Uh, yeah. They, oh, they're yeah, they're absolutely. getting, you know, there, there's a case where that money has been held down because of the massive mass exploitation of foreign labour. Mm. And uh, the same will, will apply in lots of industries. The, you know, wages may well go up in foreign industries but what we have to what we have to uh, explain to people is the people that are benefiting from that are not the people that are being massively exploited it's the people uh, who are running these multinational corporations yeah. who are shipping workers away from their homes because they're either fleeing wars or they're suffering mass unemployment in in particular uh, places that are not being developed under capitalism so they have to come and try to get a job and then they've been that they're being exploited. They undercut uh, wages here. We have to explain that to people. It's not those people that are fleeing's fault. And by the way, who's who's selling them the weapons? Mm. The weapons. A lot of them are coming from Britain. Aye. A lot of the a lot of these people are fleeing British guns and British bullets and British bombs uh, that are falling on their houses wherever they live and, and wherever they come from. So I think that uh, you know when when you explain to people in terms that they can understand, uh, most people aren't racist and they understand that um, refugees have to uh, be able to come, they, they seek asylum in this country. And I think that, uh, that that's the argument that the left should be having. What we shouldn't be doing is uh, shrilly and middle class accents shouting at them racist because I don't think that achieves anything. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Steve, thanks very much indeed for taking the time out to speak to us now. Thank you very much indeed for attending the Festival of Resistance. Thanks for speaking so eloquently in the plenary session just then. I know a lot of people have been really inspired to, to hear you, so I really appreciate that and look forward to working with you in the future. Well, thanks, Chris, and uh, we look forward to working with you as well. And I would have to say um, you've, you've shown fantastic resilience. You've been scapegoated. You've been attacked personally. I believe you've been betrayed and let down by people who you thought were comrades. And you're an inspiration to us all, Chris. Uh, you keep going, doing what you're doing. Hello, my name's Lizzie. I'm here with Dave Nellis, Nellist of the TUC, that's the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition. And I wanted to ask you, Dave, you've come here to the Resistance Festival and what is your idea of what you want to get from it? Well, I was pleased to uh, have the chance to come and meet up with and discuss in person um, with a number of uh, activists in, uh, in Resist with whom we've worked uh, for a wee while now in Tusk, the uh, electoral challenge to austerity that we run at election uh, times because uh, uh, the Trade Union Socialist Coalition um, is a federal coalition. It involves the RMT, the Transport Union, uh, involves Resist, uh, the Socialist Party, and a number of leading trade unionists. Uh, and to get the chance to explain to uh, newer activists uh, here this weekend at the festival uh, about the importance and scale of the challenge we want to make next year in the local elections was uh, a chance I didn't want to turn up. Yes. Well, I stood as one of your candidates in Gloucestershire, and um, last I didn't get anywhere, but I did enjoy standing. And what it gave to people in my local area, they told me, was the opportunity to vote for someone who wasn't establishment political yeah. parties. And yes, I stood on a platform of uh, no austerity for the local councils to dig into their private funds and, uh, well, public funds, to, uh, to make sure that they didn't uh, inflict any more austerity onto the local communities. And that was a lot of young people and a lot of other people, older people, middle-aged people, all sorts of people in the community, political or not, are affected by these issues, aren't they? 
They are indeed. Um, Tusk's been going now uh, since 2010. We were started by, uh, co-founded by Bob Crow, who was then the uh, the leader of the transport union, the RMT. And over the following five years to 2015, we built up these challenges like you've just described around the country. And in 2015, uh, we stood 135 parliamentary candidates and 619 council candidates. And we were the sixth biggest party in the country, though you'd be forgiven for not knowing or remembering that, given the paucity of coverage we were getting in the mainstream uh, uh, media. Then Jeremy was elected. Uh, in September of that year, and we reined back. We didn't. We withdrew from the 2017 and 2019 general elections, um, without belabouring the point. Obviously, Labour under Keir Starmer in the last 18 months has changed. The 600,000 people, many of whom, perhaps the majority of whom, were inspired by Jeremy, uh, are now totally dismayed by uh, Keir Starmer, and 150,000 of those have left in the last. That's months. at least because they've uh, Labour Party have refused to uh, publish their membership numbers. Absolutely, and, and, and you've got to wonder why. Well, we we want to try and create something um, that means those hundred and fifty thousand people plus who were inspired by Jeremy are not just demoralised and lost to the uh, the struggle. And that's why we're focusing. Uh, in two stages, but on the uh, May elections next year, which are going to be much bigger than this year, there's about 4,500 seats up this year, there's 7,000 seats up for uh, uh, next year. And so in the autumn, we're trying to organise in every town and city what we're calling people's budget conferences, where we're writing to local trade union branches, to potential rebel councillors on local authorities, to campaign and local community groups, and saying not just what do we want to defend, the library, the community centre, the youth club that is under threat. But what does this area actually need? Yeah. Um, can we build a budget that says uh, working people in this area need to repair or to extend services to give a decent life? And then can we have a coordinated fight against the Tory government for the necessary funds to deliver those services? Not a question of money. They found £400 billion over the COVID uh, uh, period. Uh, there certainly should be the ability to get the billions necessary to rebuild public services locally. So we're trying to do that. And my personal hope is that we'll at least double the number of candidates we had this year and that in 10% of all seats next year, in other words, in every major town and city, there will be an anti-austerity challenge at the ballot box. Yes, because I think there will be too, because I think it was called the rise of the independent councillors, uh, an excellent article, which I shall put a link in for anybody watching the clip in the future. And uh, that said, that the, the amount of independent councillors that were elected this last year, uh, 2021, yeah, trying to think then. With the lockdown, we've all lost a year and a bit, haven't we? If not our marbles completely. So, yes, we, we do need to do this and we need to let people know because so many people just watch mainstream media listen to the radio and that's mainstream media news uh, read their newspaper and they don't know that they're even voting against their own interests aren't they because they oh boris has done an okay job in the circumstances no way has he done an okay job in the circumstances he implemented austerity well not him but the tory party implemented austerity in the first place and now the Labour Party is exactly the same as them. The only way to go is independent councillors or TUSC, so Socialist Coalition, isn't it? I think so. And I think it's um, not just the figures that we've given about individuals leaving Labour, but now there are unions reconsidering their position. Yeah. Uh, the Baker's Union... Uh, because of the Kafkaesque situation that their president is auto-expelled from Labour for being a supporter of an organisation that wants to campaign against expulsions and witch hunts. Yes. Uh, and the Bakers uh, recalled their annual conference uh, last month and almost unanimously at that yeah. conference decided to leave Labour. What's less well known is that another transport union, the TSSSA, the Transport Salaried Staff Association, at its conference last month also decided by a majority at the conference to ballot and consult their members over their continued uh, link to, to Labour. Sharon Graham has just been elected the uh, General Secretary of my union. She's going uh, to... Yeah. is reviewing in, in, in the light of what she calls a workers' uh, politics the way in which 
um, unite, operate uh, politically. And disaffiliation doesn't mean non-political action. That's no, the, the words that, that Sarah Woolley, the General Secretary of the Bakers Union, actually said. We're going to be more political yes. now. We're no longer yes. tied to the pro-big business, pro-austerity uh, agenda of the Labour Party. Yes. Well, thank you very much for coming along and talking to us, Dave. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of the weekend and speak to you again soon. Thanks very much thank indeed. You. Bye-bye. I'm here with Rod Driver and he's got a thing called Elephants in the Room. It's a blog that gives you easy to understand step-by-step instructions on how to understand the uh, the difficulties in economics, in the big war machine, in all sorts of subjects. And he's been speaking today on the same panel as myself on resisting corporate media. And I'd just like to ask you, Rod, what did you get out of it? What do you think that we can do going forward? Do you think we achieved anything today? Oh, absolutely. I think we did. I think it's really important to have these a sort of large gatherings because you have to remember that everybody's been online for the last year and a half and it's only when you actually get to meet people in person you get to really know them get to talk about their backgrounds and their life experiences and everybody here has very different life experiences and all sorts of different things that they can contribute to discussions about how we can create a movement that will enable us to move forward and actually challenge the way our society works and bring about positive change for everybody in the future. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, what we got from, what I got from it was that so many people felt uh, dis- disempowered um, by about how to get their stories into media because, of course, they c- mainstream media isn't interested in their stories and they've they sort of even seem to self-dispose of themselves because they say, well, of course, you wouldn't be interested in my story, and off they walk. Yes, well, I think... think, You know, like, I'm waiting for your story. You know, I really want to publish your story. Please tell me. So you've written this blog about how to understand the subjects that someone like myself might publish a story about an article or Matt Kennard might pr- produce an article that is quite technical in its language and and you you do that a bit differently well yeah so I've been researching these things for the last 20 years and I realized that there's there's something sort of missing that if you look at what academics produce and what a lot of uh, mainstream writers produce, it is very technical and it's very, very difficult for people who are new to this and for lay people to, to really understand what's going on. So I set about writing a series of beginner's guides. So some of them will be critical of war crimes by the British and American governments. Others are critical of the media system or the democratic system and others are critical of the economic system. And the idea is to be able to present to anybody, any member of the public, even school children, a basic understanding of how the world actually works in practice and how to be able to see through the slightly distorted version of events that we receive from the mainstream media, which is very uncritical. Slight, slightly distorted? Or, well, yes, perhaps that's an understatement. In fact, in many areas, it's very distorted. So it enables them to see through the propaganda that the government puts out in relation to destroying other countries and its war crimes. And then that enables them to see through the propaganda in relation to how the corporate system works and so on. So I think over time, if we can, it would be great uh, to develop networks of people who would be interested in understanding this in more detail and then spreading the message wider and wider and ideally start to introduce this type of material in schools and universities so we get a new generation of young people who are much more aware of how um, distorted things actually work. Yeah, how, how things actually work and how distorted uh, the media version of events is and how criminal many of the most powerful people in our societies are and we'll actually think seriously about bringing about change. Yeah. Well, I think our young people, I've, I've been on many Zoom meetings, <laughs> as have we all, but I was quite impressed by the amount of young people that are crit- thinking critically and are investigating and are standing up even. Just yeah. standing up and, and saying something is difficult. So these easy-to-understand uh, guides in how to interpret technical language i think that yes what we could do as journalists and publishers we could uh, put links to elephants in the room on every article 
if it's related to the subject that you've done a, 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 a piece on? Well, that would be really brilliant. And that's something I've been discussing with uh, many of the critical websites recently, that they do outstanding critical journalism. But new readers come to these websites without any real understanding of the background to what's really going on. If all they've ever seen is news from the BBC, when you see an article that says, actually, the destruction of Libya is a war crime, most people don't really know what to make of it. It so completely contradicts everything they've ever been taught that they, they tend to sort of shy away from it because it makes them uncomfortable. So the idea here is to actually give them the, the basic grounding to understand what's really going on in the world and to understand how different topics are actually linked to each other. And so it's all interconnected. So to give them a fairly holistic understanding of the world. And that will then enable them to make sense of critical material when they come across it on different websites. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank Rod and thank uh, Elephants in the Room. It's a blog and on the website you can Google it. So please do. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Chris Jones. Um, I'm one of the co-hosts of the Resisting the Climate Catastrophe session. Um, I'll be honest, yesterday it was fantastic talking to everyone, um, having the discussions, getting lots and lots of feedback um, and really kind of learning as, as we went along. So there was a lot, lot of information that we gave out, but also just the way that people perceived the information and, and, and everything else. Uh, and also the requests for, for additional information were, were absolutely amazing um, for me. So uh, it, was, it was a great session and I look forward to the one that's going on today as well. Hi, um, I'm Steve Gower. Um, I live in Gloucestershire. I've been a volunteer advocate for the homeless and the threatened homeless for about five years. And I'm also a member of it Insulate Britain. Um, I'm also co-hosting this event today with Chris. And um, I too have got to admit that there's some good good ideas and, 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 and really interesting conversations being had. and. Uh, yeah, looking forward to the rest of the sessions. I'm here with Sheila. I don't know your surname. Coleman. Sheila Coleman. Uh, she has been fighting for many years and somewhat successfully and somewhat unsuccessfully about the Hillsborough disaster. And uh, I would just like really to hand the mic over to you to just tell us a bit about you've come to the Resistance Festival today. What do you? Th why did you come? What do you think that? You, uh, what have you got out of it? And how do you think that we can go forward? And tell us a little bit about your campaigning and what you've been doing. Please. Yeah, sure. Um, well, Chris invited me to come along. I did. Um, I did a Zoom meeting on Resistance TV early in the year, and um, I found that really interesting. The other people involved, etc. Um, so when. Um, he invited me to this. I was happy to come along because I think that more than ever, resistance is needed. And it's always uplifting to be around people with similar views. We don't all agree, but um, it leads to decent arguments. And I love having a good argument. Um, I was part of uh, a workshop around resistance and justice. So I was with John Dunn from the Orgreave campaign and I was with Gloria from Jengba and um, Siobhan McConville from the Craig Avenue couldn't be with us, but we did raise the case of the ongoing uh, Craig Avenue campaign. For me, um, I feel a moral obligation to actually uh, pass on anything that's been learnt along the way around Hillsborough. It's gone on for, you know, the Hillsborough disaster occurred in 1989, so we're talking in excess of 32 years. So along the way, uh, many lessons have been learned, mistakes made, uh, but valuable um, experience and um, you know, with my social social conscience, I feel that you have to pass that on to others uh, involved in campaigns that are not so uh, so far down the road. Because I, you know, I think I said when I spoke that um, I know that in the many dark years around Hillsborough, when nothing seemed to be happening, we grew inspiration from a drew inspiration from the uh, Bloody Sunday campaign, and um, you know the longevity of that. And um, the Savile Inquiry was ongoing throughout a lot of that time. And so it's around um, being in a climate where people will listen and um, will take on board what you're saying 
and you come away having learned something as well. Um, one of the women who had come along to the workshop today was talking about her brother in prison. He was imprisoned for um, three years, six months, and um, he was also um, under this uh, imprisonment for protection of the public, which was something I think brought in um, in the early part of this century, and I think David Blunkett had a hand in it. And um, this person who was sentenced to three years, six, six months, is still in prison 16 years later because um, under this IPP. Now, that was something new to quite a few of us. It was really interesting listening to this woman. And so that's something valuable that's being learned, that, you know, you can pass on, uh, you can you can move forward on it. Also as well, uh, Gloria from Jengba um, said, it would, I'd love to get together with other people. And, you know, some of the things we're saying, you know, it's, it's you know, I, I'd like to learn more, whatever. And so we kind of sowed the seeds of um, a conference or what call it what you will, but basically getting together of the various campaigns. And for me, one of the issues around campaigns is, I mean, the Hillsborough campaign, we, we had the advantage, although our particular campaign, the Hillsborough Justice campaign, was only formed nine years after the disaster. There was another the Hillsborough Family Support Group was just that. It didn't involve survivors. And in fact, a lot of the bereaved families didn't like the way it operated. And then that's how the justice campaign was born. And it was a broader church. It was, And it was very much a grassroots organisation based in the Anfield area where Liverpool Football Club is. And... Um, we became an asset to the community because of other things that we got involved in and did. Um, we were lucky in the sense that although it wasn't it was it was a it was a major injustice and a miscarriage of justice but it the the focal point was football and so we could draw on the support from football supporters and so we were really lucky in that sense and i always feel that you know individuals fighting campaigns it can be a very lonely place we propped each other up um, over the years and sometimes literally propped each other up as people were worn down um but you think of someone like Janet Alder, whose brother Christopher uh, was killed by the police in Hull. You know, Janet um, fought and continues to fight um, for Christopher every step of the way. And what we know about the circumstances of Christopher's death, we would never know only for that sisterly love and determination to fight. So we have an obligation to, to support people like um like Janet, and I know when when I was um, do, uh, speaking at the plenary session, I mentioned the case of Noah Donahue, the fourteen-year-old boy um, who was killed in Belfast. Um, there's a dreadful cover-up around that, and unfortunately, um, it doesn't fit in with the political narrative of the time. And um, you know that really makes me angry because you cannot compromise truth and justice to fit in with the prevailing politics and that's what's happening in the case of um noah donahue don't rock the boat but i tell you what that will backfire because fiona donahue she only had noah and um you know, the pain is etched on her face. It's a loss that none of us would ever want to go through. Um, but you do not cross a mother and uh, when she has a mother's love for her child. And she will fight to the end, as Hillsborough mothers I know fought to the end. And, you know, the sad thing around Hillsborough is that so many of the people I work closely with are dead. And um, a lot of their deaths were premature and they compromised their physical well-being for um, fighting for justice for their dead children. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, and now, largely, our campaign is being written out. The prevailing narrative um, has no place for the justice campaign. Uh, instead, both politically and in terms of the media, it's better to accommodate um, individuals, part of the camp campaign, but who are somehow, uh, um, you know, have foisted on them the label of somehow being special and superhuman fighting for justice, um, like a, a one man or one woman campaign. 
but it wasn't yeah. um if, if if individuals are singled out people need to remember not to take anything away from what those individuals did but they need to remember that what they had behind them was a campaign of literally thousands and without that campaign um the the establishment Nobody wouldn't have caved they wouldn't have they wouldn't have caved in yeah. i mean you know to get to the point where david cameron as prime minister apologized uh, said there was a conspiracy a cover up and um lies were told and statements were altered at one time we never thought we'd get that and um in 2016 all those years after the disaster in um 1989 uh to have Ac uh, an accidental death verdicts were quashed in 2012 but then in 2016 to have unlawful killing verdicts um you know uh, decisions uh, brought against the dead of hillsborough 90 they all died you know were killed unlawfully of course then we have the prosecutions and no one's held accountable so yeah. you know who's supposed to have killed them so we have that bizarre situation where we have the evidence and that's the buy-off that's the compromise you know they'll give you so much but they're never going to give you it all and i think if we can pass on that knowledge to campaigners that you will have to compromise and you know be wary when people in positions of power are being nice to you they're either climbing the greasy pole in terms of their own career or they're being nice to you because they are buying you off and the saddest thing for me is um how people have been uh, co-opted uh, in so many ways after Hillsborough. Hillsborough's not the only one, but, yeah. but just saying that. And um, how then truth uh, becomes, really becomes a casualty yeah. of the whole system. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for spending your time with us. And I hope that all of you listening at home will join a local campaign, whatever it might be, whoever's suffering, please join a campaign, do whatever you can to help. And if you're a journalist, Please write the stories and be the voices. Daniel, folks, it's a great honour and privilege to have you agree to speak to us. And I think we first met, didn't we, uh, not long before I was suspended when you asked if, yeah. or was, had I, may I have been suspended, I don't yeah, know, I but when you did my portrait. Yeah, Tell us a bit about your portrait work that you've been doing. Then, yeah, you've absolutely. It's, um, I met you in 2019. Ah, so I probably had uh, been suspended already yeah, then. It was, yeah, it was all, it was all, all happening. And... Um, yeah, kind of, uh, uh, it's been an honour to use my art to show sol solidarity for all those that have been smeared and treated so badly by the Labour Party. Uh, the Labour Party have been keeping me in work. I mean, they can uh, they can expel people faster than I can draw. Yeah. And uh, the bastards owe me a few pence <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> there's been good people from Jackie Walker, Mark Wadsworth, yeah. yourself, and, and so yeah. many others. Uh, and I've also used my art to kind of promote those that have stood up and called out the smears, people like Alexis Sale, Michael Rosen, yeah. people that have challenged the narrative and and kind of giving me hope and courage in these bleak times. Yeah. It's, um, How did you get into the, the art? I mean, because obviously a lot of people are familiar with you now. I've seen you quite prolific on, on social media yeah. and aware of your work. Yeah. And uh, I think often people are, are interested, really, in kind of how do people get into it and well, when did you realise well, you got that talent? Art, yeah, uh, yeah. It's, um, well, I see, you know, my art as a hobby. Twitter is what I do now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, oh, no, I've always loved uh, drawing and, and painting ever yeah. since I was a, a wee kid, so... Uh, are essential to my to my life it's uh it's how i make sense of the day mm. and um yeah i love it i i mean i, I don't i don't sell my work i do it mm. uh, for my own reasons and um, i'm a teacher and yeah i love that uh, uh, as well yeah but uh, it's been great to actually use my art um in a way that supports my political activism I mean, it was a good example of that, of course, when the uh, witch hunt was at its height against me personally yeah. and uh, Billy Bragg <laughs> joined in the fray and uh, compared me to a, a UKIP guy who had um, made some rape jokes about Jess yeah, Phillips and, and, and drew a yeah. comparison with me. And I think various people took him to task and, and you certainly did. And, yeah. and you'd actually done a portrait, Billy's portrait, aren't you? And then, yeah. you, then you posted his portrait in a, in a skip, I think <laughs> yeah. it was. So tell, tell us a bit I, about I, that. That's a funny story. It was... Um, I mean, I'd met Billy in 2015. I'd been a fan of Billy all my me life. Too, me too, me too. I thought, you know, I mean, part of the sad experience of the, the Corbyn years is that so many that I looked up to and respected and wanted to be strong have turned out to be weak and, uh, and less than helpful, shall mm. we say. 
Uh, but yeah, I met Billy in 2015. He came to my studio. He posed. I did the uh, series of drawings of him. I did the paintings. And, you know, I, I liked him personally. And um, so when you were, you know, uh, having your troubles, I kind of sent out a load, load of emails to everyone saying, I stand with Chris Williamson. Do you do? do uh, I hope you do too. I copied him in, expecting, you know, Billy would know what side yeah. he was on and show solidarity. He got back to me to say that uh, actually I don't. Um, and he you know, came up with all these mm. strange reasons. Um, I got back to him and said, you know, I'm very disappointed. And then I kind of um, jokingly uh, did, a, did a, posted some uh, tweets of all my uh, uh, drawings of uh, Billy Bag. There were scans of my, <laughs> my yes, Billy yes, Bag yes, drawings, yes, yes, yeah, you know, yeah. all torn up or in the bin, yeah. uh, or my big large painting of him in the skip and saying, you know, I'm not saying that I took the news of Billy's betrayal badly, yeah. but... <laughs> <laughs> yes, he well, did. Anyway, he, so I copied him in. He saw that and went fucking mental. I know he did, I, I know he did, He yeah. totally lost his cool yeah. and he was yeah. like swearing at me and uh, telling me that I should burn him and yeah. tell yeah. me to F off and all yeah. this. And I said, I got back to him, I said, I'm not going to burn them and I'm not going to throw them under the bus like you have. Yeah. I'm going to, you know, use these drawings in a way that will actually help the cause. Yes. I'm going to donate them to Chris Williams. Yeah, yes, we did, yeah. <laughs> and so we ended up... That, up. That's right, and yeah. I had, we had, remember, I had we, to we did. Because uh, we talked about uh, um, sort of uh, doing an auction on them to raise money for, right. the le uh, le uh, for the legal uh, fighting absolutely, fund. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it was... Um, yeah, God, I mean, it just, it's just been yeah, so indeed. sad that people yeah. I, I looked up to and wanted to be, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. on, on our side. And no, the, indeed. The big fact, we had one opportunity there with the Corbyn mm. uh, years, and I believe that many in the left blew it. No, I totally agree with you. But, I mean, I think, you know, bringing art into the movement, because, uh, I mean, Jackie Walker made the point about, you know, it should be about not just, I mean, talking's great, and that is important, obviously, yeah. and a lot of the stuff that we've been hearing today, we had some, and indeed yesterday, great inspirational uh, speakers and so on, and that's yeah, important, God, recharging amazing. the batteries. But she Absolutely. said... And the whole kind of bread and roses argument, I suppose, you know, saying, you know, we should be singing and dancing and so on. This kind of whole notion of bringing art into no, totally. the movement and using art in the movement. Just, just say a bit about what your thoughts are about no, how we no. can use art as a way of, uh, you know, means of communication and drawing people in. Oh, completely. I mean, that's that's what I grew up in. My mum and dad uh, were involved heavily in community arts in the, in the, the 70s. They uh, set up Brass Neck Theatre Company and they ran massive play schemes and built massive adventure uh, playgrounds uh, in Livingston, West Lothian uh, back then. And, you know, the philosophy was that everyone be, can be creative, mm. regardless of your background, regardless of who you are. It's a human right to connect with uh, and to be creative in a personal, meaningful way through music, through dance, through mm. art, through all, all, all sorts of stuff. And so, that, I mean, that's a culture I, I grew up in. That's what I, that, that, that's, so I've always seen a kind of connection between art and political activism. It's about, you know, we're in politics because you know we want to fight inequality, yeah. you know, uh, but we want people to kind of you know fulfil their potential. And part of fulfilling your potential is, is connecting with what it is to be alive. Yeah. And and, and art's a way of doing that, of, of, of making sense of your own experience and and that of others. Yeah. And so you know I see it as you know the the, the two are intertwined. No, indeed, and, and you know hopefully in the fullness of time we can give people those opportunities to you know engage with art to Absolutely. become artists them themselves as it were something i'm you know very passionate uh, about that, yep. that you know we need to be kind of giving those chances those opportunities and in a you know and as i keep going on about the fifth biggest economy in the world oh. that that shouldn't be a, a, an issue really and, and and a currency i mean what we've had a great session today with bill mitchell yeah, about amazing. modern monetary theory and uh, you know we have our own sovereign currency and that you know literally this is about political world we can do all of these things we can create a good society we can give people access yep. to to the arts uh, you know to to, to education and a to a uh, decent pension and good public services Completely. and all the rest of it it's just about political will but i was just going to ask you though about um obviously great that you're here daniel we're mm. actually you know honored we really are and I, I mean that actually because you know you're a bit of a legend in the movement and to see you here exhibiting your, your work i mean have you found the uh, uh festival of resistance and kind of reaction to to your um, exhibition that you've done yeah, with yeah. some, some well, of the figures that you've that you've uh, drawn i've absolutely loved to come here i mean thanks for inviting me i would have you know it's just I'd have done anything to be here, and it's been absolutely great. Great. Uh, so the speakers have been amazing, and it's been great to chat up with uh, old friends and make new ones. Mm. And it's you know so funny meeting people that I've <laughs> engaged with on Twitter. For the yes, last indeed. Five, you know, yeah, of course. Three yeah. years, three, four yeah. years, they'd actually meet them in the flesh. Person, I mean, yeah, it's yeah, like they're all yeah. like, they're like family. To yeah, in fact, I've spent more time with them than indeed, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I have yeah. my own family. Uh, That's uh, a good thing, actually, isn't it, about yeah. social? I mean, I know social media, but you know, it's kind of got lots of positive, but it's got a lot of mm. negatives as well, and so mm. on. But uh, it's sometimes, you know, it's funny because 
because like you, I remember, you know, today, well, this conference, but also uh, on other occasions, people I've never met in the flesh at all, yeah. didn't necessarily know them from Adam in, in real life, but then have met them. And they feel like, you know, I've known, them, I've known them all my life. We're mates. Totally. And totally. there's no kind of like, you just yeah. get straight into a conversation. Absolutely. And it's, it's, so it's great. I mean, that. I can't remember who said, I think it was Ian Foster or someone that said that you read to know that you're not alone. Yes. Well, yes, say, absolutely. You know, so absolutely. Yeah. I use Twitter to know that I'm not alone. Yeah, yeah, of course. And yeah. It's, uh, I mean, if I was relying on, which I used to, mainstream media, mm. Radio mm. 4, BBC, mm. Newsnet and all of that, I would think that, you know, I was just totally out of step and mm. it was just me. Mm. It's through Twitter which uh, I've, I've managed to connect with so many other like-minded people. Mm. And yeah, it's it's just good to know there's other people out there that, you know, that care yeah. about inequality and no, understand indeed. what's actually going on and how, mm. how that we have been completely, you know, screwed by the, the powers Absolutely. That I mean, I think there's one of the things for me uh, about the Festival Resistance, one of the kind of themes that we've been talking about, is, and indeed we've mm. tried to bring this to life as it were in terms of bringing people together by getting yeah. like the workers party for example and the socialist party here they'll be yeah. speaking on the same platform later yeah. getting different pressure groups together working uh, together so there's I think a lot of people are becoming disillusioned as they were I think before Jeremy uh, became the leader of the Labour Party and people thought there's this great hope this great opportunity and that galvanized people and people were united mm -hmm. uh, or many people anyway united uh, under the uh, Labour Party umbrella but there's a lot of movements and you know we're one I suppose and one of the things we're saying is to say trying to bring people together but there's a lot of different kind of movements springing up on uh, about different issues and obviously one of those things and it's I know it's something that you're passionate about <clears throat> is it just in terms of the response to you know to Covid to the lockdown and this this notion about these kind of Covid passports and stuff like that yeah. now I know this is something that you 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 know you're very concerned about and in yeah. fact you've very kindly put me in touch with Piers Robinson and we got yeah. him on to our resistance uh, TV um, uh, live stream weekly uh, yeah. live stream and uh, we also got Fabio uh, Vargi yeah. uh, to, to speak as well and it was great but interestingly the program was taken down then by YouTube we, yeah. we, we put it back up again uh, a slightly reformatted uh, version and I think that's survived so far but it just shows a lot of a lot of pressure oh, there. But, yeah. but tell us what your thoughts are about this whole notion about, about Covid passports and so on what's your thoughts well, about I mean, that? I think that the Covid crisis is um, is being used to build back better you know, to use their phrase it's to build back better for the ruling global elite. Yeah. Not for people that like mean you or the to even better. Even they're, better. They're, they're already pretty cosseted, aren't they? Yeah, they're already running the show. Yeah. You know, the, the, the big corporations. I mm. mean, I almost don't. I mean, I was always brought up on the left to kind of. It was the nation state I cared about. And, yeah. and the, the establishment and the security services and stuff like that. I think my. The journey that I'm on is that I think there's like a power above that, which is corporate power. That kind of globalist corporate power that set the agenda of national governments. That is where uh, I think the power lies today and that's the people that are setting the agenda. Mm. Now, I fear that they're using the COVID crisis to kind of consolidate their own power. Mm. Uh, they're aware that late stage capitalism is vulnerable, that with growing inequality, with the uh, issues of climate change and all the rest, that they, you know, that there's, there's problems ahead for them. And so in order to deal with that, they need to bring in authoritarian measures in order to control the masses. And I fear that vaccine passes are going to open up the, the way to digital IDs. Mm. And digital IDs will kind of, you know, once they're in place, I think we're screwed. Mm. I think that we're giving unprecedented power mm. to the elite to control every aspect of our life. And I think it'll be the equivalent of like the Chinese social credit system, which they've been kind of trialing out in the, uh, some major uh, Chinese cities, cities in the last couple of years, where every aspect of our, our life is, is going to be controlled by, by those that are in charge. So you know, if you want to access a public space, as access uh, public transport, uh, even leave the house, uh, that'll all be at the, you know, uh, be controlled mm. through this digital ID system in some way. That, that is my fear. And There's a challenge, isn't there, though, in, in terms of, um, you know, making that case. Um, I mean, we talked, we had a, well, Pada Akani from the Canary spoke yeah. about neurolinguistics, didn't he? And, yeah. and how, uh, you know, the way things are framed in that sense. Yeah. So <clears throat> people articulating concerns about big pharma, about big tech, about government working in collaboration with them and using mm -hmm. that as a way of clamping down on our civil liberties etc yeah. as well as making even more profits for these uh, these yeah. big corporate uh, sectors that people that are concerned about that are then being 
portrayed as sort of cranks who who think yeah. it's a conspiracy. There is no yeah. such thing that COVID d didn't really happen. There. So, so how yeah. do we fight well, that, do you think, it's, Daniel? I mean, it's, that's, it's, that's it's, an it's, issue, it's, isn't it's, it's it? A very, you know, it's a very <coughs> complicated issue and, it, and, it's a, and it's a very uh, delicate one. I mean, on the issue of um, conspiracy theorists, I mean, I, as someone who's brought up on the left, as a socialist, I mean, um, I'm used to conspiracy theories. I think the one percent, the, the elite, have been screwing the ninety nine percent since well, the beginning of time, and yeah, that didn't happen by accident. No, no. Some people conspired for that course, to happen. Course, they yeah. consolidated yeah. their power, yeah. and they have done everything they can to make sure that the ninety nine percent don't get a fair share. So, you know, conspiracy theories are not necessarily a bad thing, mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, uh, there there are many conspiracy theories out there that are completely bloody crazy and, mm. and awful, and associated with the the far right and everything mm. that you know we should have nothing to to, to do with. Um, and I'm afraid that I think the left have, have, have turned the COVID issue into a, a culture war. Yeah. And they're making the same mistake they did with, with Brexit. Brexit. I mean, I'm, I'm a Lexiter. I mean, I yeah. respect people who voted uh, Remain. Uh, but, you know, I think that the Brexit issue was turned into a culture war. You were either, you know, for the EU, which is, a, you know, presented as this, you know, wonderful... Um, Progressive institution, or you're a you know a right wing racist yeah. uh, who's against immigration. Now, I think that was a bad framing of the debate. Like Bill Mitchell, I, I personally think the the EU is a neoliberal institution and that we needed to you know step out of it. Um, many of the left didn't agree, and I think it was used to to destroy the the, the Corbyn project. Yeah. I think a similar thing is, is is happening here. I think that. You know, the left buy into the greater good argument. Now, of course, I'm all for the greater good. Uh, all my politics, my values, my, my you know, <laughs> everything I do is about you want to help people. Mm. You know, we want to protect people and all the, all the rest of it. But I think that they've been, I think the left have been played. Mm. Uh, I, th I think vaccine passes, which uh, many of them are promoting. I mean, uh, the, the Labour... Um, the, the Labour group in Wales, the Labour government in, uh, yeah. in Wales, are, are, um, or whatever they're called, uh, have brought in vaccine passes uh, uh, in recent uh, uh, in recent weeks, um, and I think it's a mistake. Mm. I think they don't work in their own terms scientifically. Mm. Uh, even though my argument against vaccine passes is not a scientific one, but you know, someone that has been vaccinated can spread uh, COVID just as easily as someone who hasn't been vaccinated. Mm. Um, so the scientific argument doesn't work for me. But the civil liberty one is, is what I push. Mm. I do believe that, that it will be used to bring about digital IDs within the next you know, couple mm. of months or years. Then that will be aligned with digital currencies, uh, which will kind of centralise power and mean that what we can spend our money on and where we can go and what we can do will be ruled by the elite. They've always run the show but they are just consolidating their power and I think this is the fight of our lives. Once that's in place, it's going to be very, very difficult mm -hmm. for the left to, to rally and fight back from that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, know, I know Max Blumenthal and uh, <clears throat> people like um, Jimmy Dore yeah. in the States I've started to ask they give me hope. Uh, these they give sorts me hope. of uh, important penetrating yeah. questions about the way in which it's being manipulated, and that's yeah. not being replicated sufficiently here. I no. just think perhaps in conclusion, what, what you think, uh, you know, the resist movement should say, do, encourage on that, you know, that specific issue? Do you think this is something that we should put front and centre yeah. of what we are doing as a movement in terms I, of trying to bring people together? I, I, yeah, I mean... That's why I'm here. That's, that's what I'm kind of promoting while I'm here. And I, I would love uh, the resist movement to be part of the, <laughs> the wider mm -hmm. resistance uh, to the kind of moves towards a kind of new form of attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, I, would, I would say that, uh, that this fight is not a left-right fight. No. Uh, it is the 99% against the 1%. It is us against them. Dare I say it, it is the many against the few. But that means, and this is what some of your listeners and some of the people outside might find uh, unsettling. That means we will have to march and, and, and group with those that we don't politically agree with. Mm. And I'm not talking about left-wing politics of you know Workers' Party disagreeing with Socialist Party or whatever. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those on the right, not the far right, but the, the right, yeah, yeah. who many, and many of the right are picking up on that because there is mm. a libertarian tradition within, mm. within that uh, 
uh, political kind of movement. Uh, and I think that we, we need to join forces. Mm. Now, I loved yesterday, and I, I, I kind of, you know, was, was very inspired when I went back to my hotel uh, and was, was very moved by what I heard. But I was even more inspired when I went on Twitter and I saw what was happening in mm. Italy. Mm. You know, mass strikes, mass protests. Uh, same in France. All over the world, the people are resisting and they are, you know, part of the revolution. My fear is that if the revolution is going to happen, it will happen without mm. the say-so of the left and that the left will find themselves side, side, sidelined. I would love for people like yourself and the wider movement to, to put civil liberties, mm. which were, are entrenched in my politics, civil mm. liberties and then the quality of effect against inequality, that, they're intertwined. You can't mm. have one without the other. It's not an, ad, an add-on that you drop at the minute things get a bit tough. It's central. Yeah. That I, I need you, you guys to be part of that movement to help mm. reframe the debate. I mean, I'll finish with this. In uh, Easter, I went up to London and uh, met up with Natalie Seckler, who's yes. you know, giving some amazing talks here. And we went to the People's Assembly talk that uh, Corbyn and Howard Beckett and all that crowd were doing. And that was fine, although I did feel that it was kind of like reheated 2017 yeah. politics. I felt mm. that, that, you know, I feel the Labour left have, have lost, their, lost their way. But on the way back, I had to, to pass the, one of these anti vaccine pass uh, protests and there were so many different people mm. there. it was incredibly diverse and it's not how it's presented on social media and I felt that you know I lost you know it, it was a massive mark and I thought that's where the energy is that's what the, le the left needs to embrace those people they needed yeah. it because on the way to the march me and Natalie met this uh, young working class guy He'd come up all the way from Bournemouth and he was asking do you know where the, the march is and I said I don't think we're going to the same one pal and uh, he said, well, let me just tag along anyway. And then he was talking about, you know, corporations and mm. global elites and all the rest. And I thought, the left need to harness this boy's energy. Of course. We need to be the one talking to him. And we need to frame it within mm. our politics. Otherwise, yeah, he could, mm. you know, uh, get sidelined into, yeah. into the right. And we need to be part of that movement. We need to be central to that movement because this is the... This, what's happening now, I think there's a power grab happening now that is bigger than the neoliberal counter-revolution of 7980. Mm. That makes us look mm. like small stuff. I think that you know, fascism mm. and authority and tyranny is coming here and we need to fight now, otherwise we're fucked. Mm. Well, on that note, comrade, <laughs> thank you very much indeed for taking the time uh, to speak to us. And perhaps just in conclusion, sorry, was you going to say something I else? just want to like, thank you for organising all this. It's a lot of work, and you and your team have done an amazing job. It's just been so professionally run. Uh, the, I mean, last night was amazing. The, the food's been great, and I loved the, loved the music. And, everything. Yeah. and it is, as I said, you just, in these kind of bleak times, it's nice to know I'm not alone. And that no, there's other absolutely. people out there that care. No, indeed. And we'll build, hopefully, on this. And, uh, you know, next year it'll be, you know, you know, bigger and even better, we hope, yeah. you know. And uh, and thanks for that, that feedback. Yeah. And it's been great. And it's great to have people like you and and the others, you know, people like Bill Mitchell and Max Blumenthal and uh, yeah, absolutely. The, the various other speakers that we've uh, had uh, this weekend. Uh, it just sort of shows that, you know, there is some credibility to what we are trying to do yeah. here. And just perhaps finally say, in relation to your point about, you know, this is not a left right struggle well yep. what's one of the, one of the, our watchwords has been yes we're on the left but many of the questions that we're facing now it's not actually a left or right question and it's something that i've been arguing for a number of years yeah. actually it's not a my, matter of left and right it's a matter of right and wrong yes and that's what we i think need to Absolutely. capture and, and hopefully we can win over people like the sort yeah. of young man that you were speaking to there so thanks very much indeed daniel it's been an honor best of luck thank, thank you all you. the best cheers, cheers.